Hello everyone, my name is Leonid, I'm working in Kotlin Libraries team and today I want to talk with you about uh, Kotlin X Realization 1.0, our first public stable release of this library and uh, uh, what it's all about. Well, Kotlin X Serialization is a Kotlin multi-platform, multi-format, reflectionless serialization framework. And things we are going to cover today is to an introduction for, to Kotlin X Serialization for those of you who are unaware of this library and never used it. Then we'll go over serialization APIs, what you can use and, uh, in this library and uh, how you can benefit from it. And we are of course uh, going to cover some new features in 1.0 that I want to present you. Then we'll discuss uh, future plans to, uh, for further development of this library and we'll cover a setup for new users and a migration path for our old users that used uh, previous pre 1.0 versions. So let's start with a brief introduction of what Kotlin X serialization is. So you may ask, uh, why do we need yet another JSON parser for Kotlin if we already have uh, libraries like JSON, Moshi, JSON, and so on? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Uh, all these libraries are Java libraries. So they may not work well with Kotlin in some certain ways. Uh, and I'll show you an example of it. But first of all, the Kotlin X serialization is, of course, a multi-platform library and uh, it supports uh, all Kotlin flavors, Kotlin GVM, Kotlin JS, and Kotlin native. So you can use uh, your serializable model in common code on your Android application, on iOS, and in your backend server, and what, whenever you like. And so this is one of the important features, but not all of them. So why it's called Kotlin-oriented library? Let's uh, start with a simple example. We have a data class project that has a name, which is string, and a language property, which is also a string, and has a default value Kotlin. So, and we try to parse uh, such a JSON that uh, have a name property, but doesn't have a language. So if we try to parse uh, such a string with a JSON, uh, we'll find out that uh, it uh, doesn't know anything about Kotlin default values. So the language here would be null, which is obviously very bad for us because it breaks a type system. We get a null in the non nullable property. We got runtime crashes, we got bugs all over the place, and it's hard to catch them. So of course, if we try to parse such class with a Kotlin X realization, uh, it knows everything about Kotlin, about Kotlin default values and it correctly inserts a default value from the class constructor. The another major point, point and difference, difference of Kotlin serialization from other libraries is it being explicit. So every serializable class has corresponding serializable annotation. And if we try to, and if we forgot such an annotation, for example, here we try to add to the project a new class, data class user, which is not serializable. So we try to add the property. And the compiler tells us that serializer for type user has not been found. So it, this class cannot be serializable anymore. And what's important here is that this is a compile time check. So it saves your build time, it saves your time to find bugs that this code simple would, simply wouldn't compile and saves and it helps. So, but of course, explicitness doesn't mean verbose. As you know, Kotlin is explicit and concise language, so Kotlin is serialization too. Let's break down another example with JSON, where we try to parse a, a list of projects. So if we simply put a list class Java here, we surprisingly, surprisingly find out that uh, actually this is not a project class. This is a linked trim up from a JSON. And that happens because, of course, uh, as you know, the GVM erases, erases gener generic arguments. So JSON doesn't know that uh, this is a list of projects. Uh, it only knows that this is a list of something. And it tries to save you by putting all the properties in the map. But we, of course, again, get runtime errors, crashes, and so on. Uh, 
uh, you may already know that to solve the problem, this problem, you need to provide a JSON with a type token. So we create an anonymous object here, providing a type token, and it correctly captures all the generic arguments, and we get our project at last. But this code looks quite cumbersome. It is uh, hard to understand without, uh, deep, without deep understanding of the problem. And it looks ugly. So, uh, well, if we compare it to Kotlinx serialization, Kotlinx serialization knows about generics something, uh, and it correctly parses our project class without uh, additional uh, construction. So we just call decode from string, list of projects, and uh, it simply works. Let's uh, take a closer look at this magic. So in Kotlin 1.4, uh, we have a new type of function, function that uh, is in line, refined, and returns Ktype. Ktype is, works mostly like a type token, so it captures generic information. If we ask for type of, of some complex generic type, like a box from, of lists of string data and print it, we get uh, all the generic arguments. But what's important here is that this type of function is a compiler intrinsic, so it doesn't create you an anonymous object. It uh, almost doesn't have any runtime footprint. And it works, it works again in all the multi-platform firewalls, so on Kotlin JVM, Kotlin JS, and Kotlin Native. So of course we can use this function and uh, write our own serializer function, which is provided in Kotlin X serialization, to create a serializer for box li of lists and so on. So I will uh, not cover today totally what case serializer is for us uh, now. It's important that case serializer is an uh, entity that uh, know, knows how to serialize and deserialize uh, a particular class. So, and uh, uh, creating a serializer from a type token is equivalent to creating a serializer by your hand and uh, using it in the, any of the decode function. So if you want to find out more about what case serializer is and internal architecture of the Kotlinx serialization, you can uh, come and watch my talk called uh, Design of Kotlinx Serialization uh, from KotlinConf 2019. It's available on YouTube in the playlist with all the KotlinConf talks of that year. So what uh, I want to also highlight is that Kotlinx serialization actually not uh, only JSON library. It provides a lot of formats and they all have uh, similar APIs. We have also CBOR, uh, protocol buffers, and some other formats, and even community formats that people contribute. contribute. So, and they all have a similar uh, useful uh, naming convention. So, no matter what, if you want to convert your Kotlin class to a byte array, or to a string, or to whatever entity, all these functions called encode, encode to something. So, we have uh, encode to byte array, for protocol buffers, we have encode to string from for JSON and so on. And the uh, inverse conversion is called decoding from something. So we have a decode from byte array and decode from, from string. And uh, we try to uh, make all the formats uh, follow this naming convention. So no matter what format do you use, you will uh, always know how to uh, use this object and what functions to call. And another interesting design decision I want uh, uh, to present is the future-proof uh, future configuration of all these formats. Uh, let's start again with the problem. In the pre-1.0 releases, we had a class called JSON configuration that uh, has a lot of Boolean flux. And imagine we want to add some new cool JSON feature with a new flag. Uh, we can obviously add it, and it uh, <coughs> won't break any clients from the first look because, well, Kotlin has default arguments, so adding uh, arguments, uh, adding parameters to uh, functions uh, doesn't look like a big problem. But if we take a look to a binary dump, we'll find out that uh, cons uh, uh, 
signature of the constructor has changed. So we uh, doesn't have we we do not have uh, any more uh, init function. With previous signature, we have an init function, new init function that accepts another number of arguments. And if you uh, link with this library binary, you can get the Java land no such method error. So, uh, this problem was highlighted by Drake Wharton in his blog in uh, in a post called uh, Public API Challenges in Kotlin. You can uh, visit his blog and uh, read this post to find out more about the problems uh, of uh, binary compatibility of data classes. So we choose to, to solve it in, a, in the following way. So we do, uh, do not have a JSON configuration now as a separate class. Uh, the JSON is configured by a DSL builder block. So instead of creating JSON from a JSON configuration uh, with some parameters, you just simply open a DSL builder and uh, put all the parameters there. So now if we add uh, a new JSON flag, uh, it an ABI, it would result only in additional getters and setters in the builder class, and no other signatures would be changed. And it actually become even easier to configure JSON with uh, such an approach. So uh, in the previous releases, you had to create your JSON configuration, then create a JSON out of it. And if you want to tweak it, you had to call a copy method of the data class and create a new JSON out of it. So now you can simply create one JSON from another JSON object and uh, it becomes uh, code becomes more compact and uh, more readable. So that was a brief introduction to this library. If you want uh, to find out more about features and uh, uh, supported structures, you can uh, go to Kotlin Serialization GitHub and uh, read our big guide for new users. Now I want to cover APIs in uh, this release. So 1.0 release uh, has several APIs that come uh, in two different flavors. So we have a stable API uh, that you can use and experimental API that we want to collect user feedback on and we want to evolve. So we need some design space to work on. So stable features we provide in this release are uh, basically every feature you want from the default serialization JSON parsing library. You can serialize and deserialize classes from and to strings. Uh, all the annotations that annotations that control serialization process, like serializable, serial info, serial name, and so on, are also stable. We have a polymorphic serialization that works natively for Kotlin sealed classes, for example, and for other Kotlin uh, specific structures. Uh, we have some additional JSON APIs for manipulating JSON trees and so on. And you even can write some custom serializers if you want to tweak something. So to put uh, to sum this all up, serialization, the serialization of serializable classes is stable and binary backwards compatible. And uh, what's more important is that new compiler plugins, plugins will support all the library versions down to 1.0. So with this release, you can even use Kotlin 1.4.70 or higher and so on. So you don't, uh, if you don't want to migrate, or update your library, you don't have to. But uh, advanced usage patterns are still experimental, and uh, these patterns are, and these features are in somewhat unique to Kotlin serialization. So, as you may know, you can write a custom serial format. For example, implement your own binary encoding or text encoding or something like that. You can do this with Kotlin serialization, but this feature is still experimental because we are waiting uh, on users' feedback for our classes to do that. And we also have a schema introspection, which can be viewed as a limited reflection capabilities for serializable classes. And uh, uh, all the uh, binary formats I mentioned, like Cibor, plot above, and other methods uh, or other formats than the JSON, they are also experimental because mainly they may lack some features or have bugs, but you can use all these experimental APIs. Uh, and uh, file as box. And we also have an experimental serialization API annotation that marks 
any API that is experimental and doesn't fall in all these categories. So to sum up, the API for writing uh, format agnostic serializers, schema introspection, and implementing custom serial formats could be changed in the future. That's why it's experimental. But uh, if you accept, uh, accept this, you don't have to be afraid of this experimental API. You can use it. We will try to provide migration aids uh, if this is possible. So you uh, can migrate between releases without uh, a lot of troubles. So we encourage you to try these APIs if you need them and provide uh, us feedback. So, and uh, also we have uh, some internal functionality in the Kotlin serialization that's mainly located in the internal package or marked with internal serialization API annotation. This is the API that doesn't have any guarantees. It uh, may be deleted in the next release or wrapped out or something. So you likely won't need it, but if you find, find out yourself that you, use it, that you are using it, then it's okay, but uh, you should be aware that uh, it may be broken in the, in the next release, so you would better tell us about your use case in the GitHub issues so we can provide a proper public API instead. So, and uh, let's move on to uh, 1.0 new features. Uh, this section, uh, I think, will be interesting for whole the auditory, and both new and old users. And uh, we have a lot of new features in 1.0. They are all presented in our change work on GitHub. And here I want to highlight two of them that are most important, most interesting, and they also uh, has been requested a lot of times. So the first of them is the more flexible deserialization of JSON. And uh, it's expressed by Kyors input values flag. So what this flag does? does. Uh, let's return to our project example with the name and the language with default value Kotlin. And uh, let's try to pass the following string. So here we have language uh, property, but it has the value null. And the Kotlin serialization follows Kotlin type system. And uh, it means that you can't pass null value to a non-nullable type. So uh, usually the deserializer here would uh, throw you an exception uh, with a message that uh, uh, you can't uh, put an auto in on nullable type. But with the chaos input values flag, you can uh, uh, treat the null values as missing values. So you get your default Kotlin value right in the object. It may be convenient when you are interacting with the APIs that sometimes return now, sometimes omit the property, and sometimes do something else. So it allows for more flexible deserialization, as the title says. So let's take a look at the, another important feature, like a polymorphic deserialization. As I said, the uh, uh, Kotlin serialization supports polymorphism in Kotlin sealed classes and abstract classes natively. For sealed classes, you do not need to create any additional configuration. So let's uh, try to convert our project class to a sealed class hierarchy. So we had an owned project uh, inheritor that has an owner of type string. And we add a start project inheritor that has a starts count. So let's uh, try and see uh, how these strings would be parsed. So usually when you have a polymorphic deserialization, you have some uh, special property called class discriminator. In our case, it's type and says owned. And of course, we have this uh, owner property. So and uh, you can pass this uh, JSON to, of course, an owned project class. So and, we, and if we have a start type, with stars count. Then we get a start project after parsing. It's a usual polymorphism that worked before and it works now, so a useful feature, no surprises. But what if we have some unknown class, unknown class discriminator, like a forked one? We, don't, we do not know what forked is and what uh, this number says to us. 
So in such case, uh, usually a library throws you an exception with a message that polymorphic serializer wasn't found for class discriminator forked. Uh, but this may be not very convenient in cases that, again, you are interacting with third party APIs you cannot control, or you have independent updates on your backend server and you are writing an Android application or iOS application. And it's uh, not very not not the best user experience when server got updated, user didn't update his application and it crashed. So for that cases, we provide a flexible polymorphic deserialization. So to use it, you need to create a serializers module. We again won't cover what serializers module is here in details. For, for us, it is enough to know that uh, serializers module is a thing where serializers got registered. So you register a specific serializer for a particular inheritor in the pseudo polymorphic hierarchy. So we say that under polymorphic hierarchy with a project class, we have now a default clause that accepts class name. Class name may be now in cases there was not discriminator at all, or you can take a look at it. It's just a regular string. You can, and you can decide what serializer to use uh, depending on what string contents. Here we do not look at the string content. We simply return default project serializer, or, and we can write uh, such a class, default project that has only name and language in it. We don't get all this uh, fort count or any other properties that were there, but we can at least display some meaningful information to our user, that is some project. So as I said, we had more features. They are presented on our change log and the guide. But now let's move to the future plans because we, uh, of course, wouldn't stop with the 1.0 release. We are going to develop uh, this library further and improve it. So one of the most, uh, again, features uh, the people asked for is the IO streaming. And we are going to provide a JVM only API for Java IO streams in the next release. Uh, hopefully it will be 1.1 if everything goes smoothly. And the integration with Kotlin XIO with uh, multi-platform IO streaming will be provided when Kotlin XIO uh, would be ready. So. Uh, Kotlin XIO doesn't have a public stable release yet, so unfortunately we can't depend on it. And for inline classes, another important feature, we remember about them, we have some work in progress on them, so stay tuned. And the last part of this talk, I want to tell you uh, how to set up this library for our new users. So it's uh, really simple. Uh, first, you have to apply a compiler plugin because uh, Kotlin serialization uses a compiler plugin to work without the reflection. So it's uh, just an additional line in your uh, Kotlin DSL plugins block. So uh, under the Kotlin JVM or Kotlin multi-platform plugin, whatever you use, you just include another plugin dot serialization and that's all. For GUI DSL, it's almost the same, just the ID of plugins are a bit longer. So, and the second step uh, is to include runtime library as usual. Well, we publish it to Maven Central, but in case you want to try some dev builds uh, or another intermediate releases, you can also include JCenter to your repositories. But all the uh, 1.0 and uh, all the stable releases are going to Maven Central. And you simply include it uh, as regular implementation dependency. What's interesting here is that this uh, artifact called Kotlin X Serialization Core uh, is uh, suitable for both JVM only and multi-platform projects. So if you have a JVM Android project, you can use Kotlin X Serialization Core. It contains it, it is a, contains a JVM artifact. And if you are using a multi-platform pro, uh, multi-platform project, then you can simply include Core in your common main dependencies, and all the platform dependencies will be included automatically to a project. So you don't need to write Kotlin X Serialization Core JVM, Core JS, and so on. And for our experienced old users who have been with us for so long, I hope, we prepared a small migration guide. So if you update from, say, 0.20 to 
you may notice that some uh, decorations got deprecated. For example, a JSON stringify got this nice deprecation error that uh, this message that using stringify is an error, and this method was renamed to encode to string. So, but you do not have to rename it manually. Uh, we used a uh, standard uh, Kotlin mechanism of deprecations. So, if you hit Alt Enter, you see that you have replacement. You can replace this encode to string it right away, or even replace it in the whole project. So, when you uh, hit the Enter one more time, it uh, replaces for you automatically. So, and uh, for most of the deprecated declarations, we have such a replacement. So. Basically, migrating would be just hitting the Alt Enter. And in case you encounter some problems or unresolved references, it is possible that uh, the entity you are, look, uh, you are looking for just was just moved to another package. So you can include star parts for default package, built-ins, JSON, and modules, and that would be all. It would, it uh, should work. So we also have a big migration guide, and as, as I said, change log with all the renamings on our GitHub, so we can visit it and uh, find out more information. So that was all for today with Scotland X realization. Uh, thank you for joining the talk, and have a nice Scotland.